Hi, everyone. This Core IM episode will count for CME credit with the American College of Physicians. We'll link the URL in the show notes, so follow the link, complete three questions, and get CME credit. And without further ado, cue the intro. It's funny because even when we're called, and I'm sure you guys have had this experience where the nephrology team is following that hyponatremic patient with you and like day three comes and the sodium's the same and everybody's like, oh, you know, we're doing our best, but hyponatremia is complicated. (laughs) That's Dr. Jeffrey William, a nephrologist at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. And I am just so appreciative hearing even a very smart nephrologist say that hyponatremia is complicated. Yes, because hyponatremia is complicated, but we're going to try to demystify that at least a little today. Welcome to the Core IM Five Pearls podcast. This is Dr. Marty Freed, a primary care physician at the Ohio State University Wexner Medical Center. And this is Dr. Shreya Trivedi, an internist at the Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. Whoa, 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 Shreya. Let me tell you, Buckeye Nation really doesn't appreciate when you steal their V. Okay, how can I not make fun of that? Also (laughs) joining us today is Dr. Tim Rowe, currently a chief resident at the University of (laughs) Wisconsin-Madison. Marty, do you want to say it this time? Go Badgers! Oh, thanks, Ray. (laughs) It's been a while. Love Madison. Love Tim. Love Lamp. Boy, are we happy to have you here today, Tim. Hey, thanks for having me, guys. It is great to be back. Yes, and also thank you to our friends at AMBOSS, which is also a medical education platform for all levels. We've been working with them behind the scenes to create this episode. Yes, big shout out to AMBOSS. They have tons of easy to use content on things really ranging the spectrum from drug dosing to radiology imaging, even management checklists. And if you're looking for something more comprehensive on hyponatremia, We did work on an AMBOSS article on hyponatremia that will be linked in the show notes. And they also have a free trial of their knowledge app if you want something quick and easy on your fingers. And today, we're going to start the first of a two-part series on hyponatremia with diagnostics, especially because with hyponatremia, we usually rely on that same old tired algorithm. I find that that algorithm that I was bequeathed by my you know, residents when I was a med student about how, okay, first you figure out the volume status, then you figure out if it's ADH or not. It implicitly suggests that there is one etiology that is driving the hyponatremia. And I have found, again, from experience consistently, that is almost always never the case. Corian listeners might recognize that voice as our very own Dr. John Wong, Bellevue Hospitalist, and of course, co-host of our Health Beats segment on Corian. And so today, we wanted to break down hyponatremia a little differently by moving beyond rote memorization of that algorithm. And instead, think about what tests we're actually ordering and how they can help us describe what's happening to our patient physiologically. So that the next time you're admitting a patient with unexplained hyponatremia, we want you to think of these tests as like your four buddies, each with their own purpose and personality, kind of like the Beatles of hyponatremia. (laughs) No, no, no. Hyponatremia labs are like the Avengers. Come on. Nick Fury's serum awesomes, Iron Man's urine awesomes. Okay. Okay. Um, What about like Houses of Hogwarts or the Channel 4 News team or the (laughs) A-team? I could do this all day. And with the look Shrey is giving me right now, I think we should get started on the questions we'll be covering. Yeah. (laughs) Test yourself by pausing after each of the five questions. Remember, the more you test yourself, the deeper your learning gains. Pearl 1. General Diagnostic Approach What are common pitfalls in the general approach to hyponatremia? Pearl 2. Serum Osmolality What does serum osmolality tell you? Pearl 3. Urine Osmolality What does the urine osmolality tell you, and how can you use it to help you understand if your intervention is working or not? Pearl 4, urine sodium. What does the urine sodium and urine urea tell you about the causes of hyponatremia, and are fractional excretions of sodium or urea useful? Pearl 5, uric acid. How can you use serum and urine uric acid levels in the diagnosis of hyponatremia? All right, Tim, start us off with a case. You got it, Shreya. So you're down in the ED seeing Miss Dee Dee Havy P, 
who was just <laughs> hospitalized for pneumonia. Her PCP sent her to the ED with a low sodium of 126 on follow-up labs. She's feeling much better since her discharge and notes that her cough and shortness of breath have totally resolved. So you quickly check to make sure she hasn't had any severe hyponatremia symptoms like confusion or seizures. But what should you do next? I don't know about you guys, but I'm looking back on her chart and hoping that her sodium has been low like this for ages. My feeling is if she's been cruising along with a sodium of 130 for the past like five years or something, we're golden, right? Well, yes and no, Marty. So that chronicity has quite a bit of implications. So hyponatremia that is not acute is actually independently associated with gait disturbances, cognitive deficits, and even just straight up a higher mortality rate in a lot of diseases. So if it hasn't been worked up before, or if there's something we can do to improve it, it's definitely worth looking into. Okay, yeah, fair. I guess when I do see one of my patients in clinic with hyponatremia, I pause, cry a little bit deep on the inside, (laughs) and pop open that dang up-to-date page again. But, I mean, I guess like all things in internal medicine, the workup really starts with the good history, right? Yeah, the history is helpful when it's helpful. But, you know, when it seems to go at odds with the numbers you're seeing, it's hard to know you know, which, which one to go with. I mean, obviously objective measurements are objective and history is important, but subjective, you know, you weren't there. You didn't see it when it happened. Yeah. I don't know about you guys, but I have definitely been burned on this before. Like my patient gives me this classic history, but it just does not jive with the objective data I get back. This case that sticks with me from a couple of years ago, her sodium was in the low one twenties, I think on presentation. And uh, she gave the admitting resident uh, overnight a history of nausea, poor PO intake, and vomiting. Okay, this time I feel like I'm definitely walking into a trap. But still, the way he's describing that really has me locked and loaded on hypovolemia. Should we uh, crack open a few liters of saline, just sort of see where it takes us, guys? She ended up getting a fair amount of intravenous fluid. And uh, by the time I came onto the case in the morning, the uh, repeat basic was already in progress. And when it came back, it you know it was 116 and she ended up going to the MICU. Oh dear, that is unfortunate. So yeah, talk to your patient, but be ready for data that might change your mind. Yes, stay open-minded. And we can also get tripped up by the physical exam because as good as we think our exam skills are, the reality is the clinical assessment only identifies hypovolemia and normovolemia about half the time. That's sort of like a crappy coin flip. So it seems like the history, the volume exam are more or less like hypothesis generating activities. And then it's really going to be the diagnostic tests that are going to help prove or disprove our hypothesis. Yes. And speaking of diagnostics, let me tell you all about my hyponatremia nightmare. It's when I walk into the room to admit a patient with hyponatremia only to see a bag of normal saline already hanging and urine pouring into the Foley bag. And all of this before any of the additional labs could be drawn. And my ED buddy is like, well, you know, he looked a little bit dry to me. And I'm like, no, how do I get my precious data? Uh, Wait, wait, can we go back to that urine a pouring line? I'm kind of getting like 12 days of Christmas vibes here. Like, say, Lena hanging urine a pouring five confused (laughs) medicine residents. (laughs) You nailed it, Marty. Yes, very, very confused. Residents, attendings, the whole team. But seriously, should I even bother getting labs after fluids are already given? Yes, you should check all of it anyway. So my feeling is this. This isn't a disaster, right? I'm so appreciative of you know my emergency medicine colleagues thinking about how to fix hyponatremia. As long as the risk is lower than the benefit, I think is worthwhile. It really... Um, it really shouldn't have a huge effect on your workup. If they made it better, fantastic. You've made a diagnosis, hypovolemic, you know? Like if they they haven't made it better, then there's something still to think about. Uh, Yeah, and as a primary care doc, I'm a big fan of the old diagnosis by therapy strategy. A patient's response to treatment can be a hugely important diagnostic tool. Truth, but my hyponatremia pet peeve is when someone justifies not getting any hyponatremia labs because they got fluids in the ED. Oh, the worst. So this is my soapbox, right? If someone is still hyponatremic, you can still get a snapshot of what is keeping their sodium low with urine and serum studies. Certainly, I am better served by approaching it as a question of, can I diagnose the state? You know, basically, someone is hyponatremic because there are certain levers 
in the body that are causing this person to be hyponatremic. In other words, to have an excess of water relative to salt. What is the position of those levers? What is sustaining this person's state? That, that's what we're trying to understand. So wherever you start the process, whether it's when the patient first hits the door or two days of inpatient care, hoping the sodium is going to trend in the right direction, how should we be approaching hyponatremia? Mentally, I'm trying to understand where they are uh, you know, on two axes that if thought of together, comprise a Cartesian space. So on one axis is the ADH level. And then the other axis is what is the patient's intravascular volume status? The reason why I try to encourage my residents to think about it this way is to reinforce the idea that you're not searching for a single etiology, you're trying to understand the state of the system. You know, the patient's hyponatremic, I get it. Why are they still this way? Okay, guys, I've got to own up and admit that I had to quickly Google Cartesian space there. That one's just not in my everyday lexicon. (laughs) But basically, we're talking about a two-dimensional coordinate system with ADH secretion on one axis and effective blood volume on the other. And we explicitly want to bring this up in the beginning of the episode because it really hammers home that in the real world, every patient's going to have several different contributors to their hyponatremia. Even if on the surface, it seems like your patient may be in the same bucket in the algorithm as the patient next door with hyponatremia. And so it's really going to be these diagnostic tests that are going to help you understand the degree to which ADH and effective arterial blood volume might be playing a factor. Whoa, I have so many questions right now. But uh, I think that's where we should leave it for now. Uh, But don't worry, guys, we're going to spend a ton of time explaining this concept very soon. All right, let's wrap up Pearl One. With respect to the hyponatremia history and physical, even the most compelling stories can be limiting or even potentially misleading. That's right. And instead of the intimidating up-to-date algorithm, we find it useful to think about hyponatremia workup within this Cartesian space of ADH on the one axis relative to effective blood volume on the other especially because the etiology of hyponatremia is often multifactorial. And so searching for a single algorithmic endpoint for clinically significant hyponatremia is often fool's gold. Boom. All right, Tim, bring us back with that case. Okay, okay. So you've got a low sodium reading. So now what? The hospital you're working in reports a calculated osmolality with the BMP. And this comes back low at 267. Remember, guys, normal value is 285 to 295, so 267 is solidly below that lower limit of normal, and you add on a measured serum osm to confirm your calculated value. I'm not 100% sure which friend metaphor we're using here, but let's say serum osmolality is your Pikachu. It's not necessarily the best, but it's probably the first Pokemon you're going to start the game with. All right, all right. Yeah, I I think I see where you're getting with that, Marty, even if it clearly is Squirtle. But uh, actually, I I think of serum osms like Alfred, you know, like Batman's butler. He wasn't always in the thick of it, but he was always there behind the scenes smoothing things over for the old cape crusader. And you definitely didn't want to sleep on what he was telling you. Yeah, regardless of what metaphor we're using, you definitely don't want to ignore what the serum osmolality is going to tell us, right? It's going to be our quality check, and it's going to tell us if it's true hypotonic hyponatremia. And in most cases of hyponatremia, we expect the serum osmolality to be low. But guys, I've kind of always memorized, okay, low serum osms, then real hyponatremia. But let's channel a little physiology Tony Brew here. Why do we expect that osmolality to be low? So I'm a big fan of channeling my inner Tony Brew here, but unfortunately, to answer that question, we're going to need to go back to that haunting serum osmolality equation. So sodium is the largest component of that equation. Remember, it's two times the concentration of sodium added to a fraction of the glucose and urea concentrations. Sodium here is making up the lion's share of the osmols in that extracellular space. And if your patient's lab value of sodium is low, then we expect the measured serum osmolality to also be low. If it's not low, then it's either isoosmotic, I guess, or hyperosmotic. And if it's isoosmotic or hyperosmotic, you know that something else is contributing to that elevated osmolality, right? because that's certainly not the sodium. And that's what keys you in. Um, And as you go along, you can rule out these other things like hypertriglyceridemia or, you know, hyperproteinemia or, you know, know, some examples where you can detect a, you know, a myeloma or some, some other cancer where there's some extra immunoglobulins. 
And just to punctuate that, if you see low serum osmolality, you're golden. Pass go, collect your $200 on the way to determining your etiology of true hyponatremia. Now, if you see a normal or an elevated serum osmolality, you got some work to do. That's right, Marty. But the first thing you've probably done, maybe without even thinking about it, is to glance at the BMP. If the BUN or glucose are significantly elevated, boom, there's your answer. Yeah, and if it's not one of those obvious osmoles in the basic metabolic panel, then go ask your patient about other commonly encountered osmoles like alcohol. Or if you find yourself wandering around a mix-up question, you might go looking for some toxic <laughs> alcohols like methanol and calculate an osmolar gap. Okay, so this is treacherous territory we're approaching. I'm going to divert us before we get too far in. <laughs> what else should we be thinking about here? So when the serum osmolality is normal, you should also be thinking about pseudo-hyponatremia. You probably all remember this nuisance, which is really just a lab error. So if the serum osms are normal, check a lipid level for elevated triglycerides and look for a protein gap to consider paraproteinemias like multiple myeloma. Or it could even be extra proteins that we give, like IVIG. Any of those might be the cause of pseudo-hyponatremia. Ooh, IVIG, good one, Dr. House. <laughs> so here's where things can get a little fun. And by fun, I mean tricky. And by tricky, I mean infuriating. Yeah. You know what perplexes me about osmolality is when I get back a normal serum osmolality in a patient who I believe has true hyponatremia. And I just get frustrated because the algorithm tells me, okay, it can't be true hyponatremia if that osmolality is normal. The algorithm is lying. Your frustration is so valid, Shreya. So think about a situation where you've got a patient with real hypotonic hyponatremia from beer potomania, but they're also acutely intoxicated with alcohol, right? So then the patient's osmolality might be normal, even though he truly does have hypotonic hyponatremia. Right. So the big teaching point here is that normal or high serum osmolality does not rule out a real hyponatremia may be going on. It just clues us in that there are other osmos around, like ethanol in the case Tim just mentioned. And there are multiple things at play. Think about it like this. It's sort of when you have a microcytic anemia and a macrocytic process going on, resulting in an overall normal MCV. So don't be tricked with a normal serum osm. We expect the serum osmolality to be low in hyponatremia. And we'll link a table in the show notes that has all the extra osmols to watch out for, and which of those osmols actually change tonicity, something that dictates where that free water goes and causes hyponatremia. Yes, definitely check that out for some solid reinforcement. So let's talk about a rookie move that's often made with ordering serum osmolality. Yes, but only check it once, please. I, I, we, get, we get consulted on patients with hyponatremia and when there's a daily serum osmolality. It's like, I don't, you don't need to do that. Like once you are confirming that the serum osmolality reflects that of the serum sodium, you're done. You know, you don't need to be checking it every day to say, yep, it's still two times the serum sodium. Yep, guilty. I have definitely been on one of those teams that checks serum osmolality, Q eight hours with all the other hyponatremia labs. Now that I know that serum osmoles are just helping me rule out that there aren't other osmoles or other offenders messing up the sodium, I'm kind of embarrassed we were checking it so often. Oh, nothing to be embarrassed about at all. But the takeaway here is that you only really need to check the serum osmolality once. And then again, only if you think something new and funky is messing with your sodium. Yeah, and with that, let's summarize Pearl 2 on serum osmolality. Since sodium is our largest osmol, we expect hyponatremic patients to have a significantly low serum osmolality. We check it once to verify that this is the case. If that serum osmolality is not low, we have some work to do. If the serum osmolality is normal, pop on over to that chemistry tab, see if there's a protein gap, or check a lipid panel looking for triglycerides. That might be causing that lab artifact or pseudo-hyponatremia. Other things to think about if serum osms are normal or high are things like hyperglycemia, or alcohol, or elevated BUN. And remember that true hyponatremia can coexist with other extra osmols, so normal serum osmolality does not mean you don't also have a real hyponatremia going on. All right, back in the emergency department where you're still conducting the most dramatic step-by-step -step hyponatremia evaluation in recent memory, your measured serum osmolality comes back low at 268, lining up with the calculated value and confirming your suspicion of true hypoosmolar hyponatremia. 
And at this point, we have to go back to what's been drilled into us from day one about hyponatremia. I make them stand up. I make them shout it from the rafters. Hyponatremia is a water problem. All right, everyone, let's stand up and repeat after Dr. William. Hyponatremia is a water problem. So we have to now figure out where that excess free water is coming from that's driving down that sodium number. And to understand where free water may be coming from, we have to understand what is happening with ADH. And if we want to get at ADH activity, which friend are we reaching for now? For me, urine osmolality and hyponatremia. That's where the money is. Okay, so clearly urine osmolality is the Iron Man of hyponatremia labs. Yeah, I mean, urine osmolality is the hyponatremia test of all tests. It's your Dorothy of Oz. It's your Beyonce of Destiny's Child. It's your Vinny of the Entourage (laughs) crew. Right, right. And this is because urine osmolality is our window to what is happening to ADH in the body. If I was trying to explain ADH to like a first year med student, I would basically say ADH makes your kidneys retain water. And the corollary to that is it makes you pee out a very concentrated urine. So what that means is when ADH is on, free water is being reabsorbed back into the body, leaving solute in the urine without water, making a spicy meatball, if you know what I mean. (laughs) Okay, so basically the urinosum comes back high, you know ADH is on. Right. And on the flip side, if ADH is off, free water is being peed out, giving your patient dilute urine. And the urine osms here are going to be less than 100 to 200. Okay. So if the urine osm comes back low, ADH is off, right? Right. But the caveat that we want listeners to remember is that just for the sake of this podcast, we're using ADH on and off just to make it simpler to wrap our brains around. But in reality, this is not a binary thing. Thinking about it in terms of not just is the ADH low or is it high, but rather how high is the ADH? How bad is it? Is it like 400, which is just modest, or is it like 1,200? Yeah. So in other words, you want to ask yourself, where is your patient on that ADH axis? Right. So is the urine osms really low, like less than 50, and so ADH is maximally suppressed? Or is the urine osm really high, close to 1,200, and ADH is maximally on? Right. And there is a caveat to this that we should mention, and that's our patients with CKD or chronic kidney disease. So with longstanding kidney disease, there's a much narrower range for what we consider to be high and low urine osms. Renal insufficiency tends to compromise both the kidney's ability to dilute urine and its ability to concentrate urine. So whereas a healthy person's kidney ought to, in response to hyponatremia, dilute the urine down to like 50 or 75, and in response to hypernatremia, concentrate the urine up to like 1,200, in someone with CKD, I know that that range is going to constrict. If they have CKD, then the most dilute that they might be able to make their urine might not be 50. It might well be 200 or 250. So I think that's how the presence of CKD affects my interpretation of the urine osms. So with that foundation, let's dive deeper into what urine osms means clinically. In the vast majority of cases, the story of hyponatremia is the story of ADH being on. But there are very few cases where ADH is not the driver of hyponatremia and not the driver of excess free water in the body. We're talking about cases that have high volume, low solute states. Right. So there are a few cases that when you get back a urinosoms that's low, less than 100 to 200, and you're thinking ADH is maximally suppressed, you want to think about, say, a scenario where someone's taking in too little solute to eliminate free water. That's your tea and toast syndrome. Or a situation where someone's just taking an overwhelming amount of volume. Yeah, this is primary polydipsia. Or some combination of both. And that's your beer potomania. I don't know why, guys, but I used to think the tea and toast syndrome was rare. But what I learned when making this podcast is it can actually be kind of common and also is super under-recognized. I'm not surprised anymore, but I'm often struck by when patients feel unwell, what they do to make themselves feel better. They revert back to this sort of primal instinct, and I don't know how it was sort of inculcated in all of us, that we should be drinking lots of water. And one pro tip is to not just ask about drinking water, but to ask about all types of drinks that our patients might be consuming when they're feeling crummy. They may make themselves feel better by saying, oh, I wasn't drinking water. I was drinking Gatorade or I was drinking something else Um, that actually wasn't isotonic enough to give them more volume. 
but it was just simply a little bit less hypotonic than water. Any sports drink is just not going to have enough in the way of nutrients um, to get you volume replete if you've become volume depleted. Any sports drink is not Pedialyte. You'll know if you drink Pedialyte, it tastes different (laughs) than a sports drink. It is salty, right? Because it's an oral rehydration solution. And so you can imagine someone who has a decreased GFR, who isn't able to get rid of their free water as well, who's feeling ill, chugging in tons of fluids, that can quickly lead to hyponatremia. And if we go ahead and check the urinosms in these situations, it may very well be on the lower end. And just for some reinforcement, if that person has CKD, it might very well be in the 200s or so range as Dr. Wang was alluding to. Beautiful. So that was all about low urinosms. Let's pivot here to situations where your hyponatremic patient has a more concentrated urine. Here we're typically thinking about urinosms greater than 300. What does that tell you about ADH? Especially at this point when we've confirmed that Tim's ER patient, Miss uh, Vasopressin or whatever, <laughs> does no, in fact no. have hypoosmolar hyponatremia with a low serum osmolality. When you meet somebody who's hyponatremic and you see that their ADH is in fact elevated and they're producing a concentrated urine, and there's really only two possibilities. Either the body has chosen to sacrifice water homeostasis, osmolar homeostasis, to defend something even more important, i.e. volume status, intravascular filling, or there is something totally independent of that that is causing the ADH to be high. And it could be something endocrinologic, or it could be the SIDH, or kind of what have you. That's, those are really, I think, the two buckets. So what John is saying here is that when you get back a high urinosms, you know that ADH is being activated. And so then you got to decide, is it in response to low effective blood volume? Or is it being secreted independent of that stimulus, right? And one of which is the infamous syndrome of inappropriate ADH. Hold on to this, because our Pearl 4 buddy is urine sodium, and that rambunctious little fella is going to help us figure out if that (laughs) ADH is appropriate or inappropriate. Yes, because there's a lot more to unpack with urine osmolality. It's going to have more uses than just being a snapshot into the ADH activity at any given moment. Yeah, so the real reason urine osms is my personal favorite is because you can actually use it to see if your intervention is working in real time. Like, say for example, you think you're dealing with a correctable cause of hyponatremia, like hypovolemia. If you're right, then giving your patients fluid will cause the urine osmolality to decrease, reflecting that ADH turning off. So each day, if I'm measuring a urine osmolality and I'm watching it go from 700 to 500 to 300 to 150, I know that that person is doing the right thing by their hyponatremia and they're going to get better, okay? Um, If it's not getting better, despite giving a liter after a liter after a liter of fluids because you think they're hypovolemic, guess what? They're not hypovolemic, right? If they were their ADH would shut off and they would correct themselves. For the longest time, I honestly didn't know what we were doing with the urine osms that we were getting like every Q6, Q8 hours with the other hyponatremia labs. I didn't know that I could compare it with what the urine osms were pre-fluids or pre-diuretics and see if the intervention we were doing was working or not. Right. So remember, if we're on the right track, the urine osms will decrease over time because as ADH is turning off, free water won't be reabsorbed back into the body. And we should start seeing all that free water being peed out, making crystal clear urine with a low urine osmolality. That's all fine and dandy when everything kind of works out and we can actually collect urine on our patients. But I don't know about you guys, but I have been in so many situations where it's just really tough to collect urine sometimes. And I remember one time someone kind of just said, oh, Shreya, why don't you just go take a look at the urine and left it at that. I never understood why or what that was going to tell me. Oh, I love looking at the urine. <laughs> did, 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 I, did I just make it weird in here, guys? No, um, <laughs> it's okay. Tell us why you love looking no, at we, the urine. No, we have to look at the urine because the color and the quantity are like a proxy of urine osmolality and ADH activity. I think is potentially the easiest of tests, which is simply walking to the bedside and looking at their urine. Urine yesterday was you know, dark yellow, and today it looks like water, then you're in trouble, right? So if you go and you see that the, the urine has become concentrated and then dilute, they're correcting too quickly, 
right? They're peeing out water, they're correcting too quickly. Um, or maybe that's what you had intended. Uh, maybe you were trying to shut off their ADH by giving them volume and simply they're getting rid of their water because their ADH is shut off. All right, that is good to know. So looking at the change in urine output and urine color with more volume or it becoming less concentrated can clue us in that we're going in the right direction. But it can also tell us if we're going in the right direction too fast, right? Right. So if it goes from dark yellow urine to crystal clear within hours, you're in trouble. <laughs> but remember, guys, the only problem with relying too heavily on visual inspection of urine is that there are other things besides urine osmolality that can affect urine color. Think about meds like rifampin or food like beets. So make your guesses, but still, you should check a urine osmolality. All right, guys, let's wrap up Pearl 3 on urine osmolality. So urine osmolality gives us a snapshot into ADH activity at any given moment. And there are two ways to use it. The first way is to answer, is ADH on or off? And if the urine osmolality is less than 250, that dilute urine means ADH is off. And the reason for excess free water in the patient is either a high volume intake or low solute state or some combination of both. But most cases of hyponatremia, ADH is present. And that is usually urine osms greater than 300 or so. And so what that tells me clinically is that ADH is around either in response to some type of hypovolemia or it's ADH gone wild. And this is what we're going to dive to in a second with Pearl 4. The second way to use urine osms is to monitor its use as feedback if what you are doing is moving the patient in the right direction. Don't forget that looking at the actual urine can give you a quick idea about the state of ADH at any given moment. And don't forget this, guys. If your patient's urine is going from just a few drops of double hazy bourbon barreled coffee stout to white claw just gushing out in front of your very eyes, <laughs> buyer beware, they may be at risk of overcorrecting. And your patient has transformed from millennial to a Generation Z in front of your eyes. Returning to Ms. Hey VP, our patient in the emergency department, we already know that she has hypoosmolar hyponatremia, and we added on that urine osmolality, which returns elevated at 600 milliosms per kilogram. And for those of you snoozing in the back row, remember, elevated urine osms means concentrated urine, which means ADH is dialed up. And so now we have to figure out why is that ADH on? Is that ADH appropriately on or is it inappropriate? And for that, we should first break down what we actually mean by that appropriate or inappropriate terminology. When we say appropriate or inappropriate, we're talking about physiology. Okay. So in your kind of classic patient with cirrhosis, right, who has this kind of, you know, underfilled sort of physiology where, you know, they're not, you know, they're circulating, their effective circulating volume is low. That's appropriate ADH release, right? It's inappropriate to you because you're like, your volume overloaded, you shouldn't have extra ADH, but it is appropriate because it's physiologic. Inappropriate ADH release is when you have ADH around that is not being stimulated by the normal physiologic pathways. So ADH is appropriate in response to either true hypovolemia, like severe diarrhea, or in sensed low volume states like cirrhosis or decompensated heart failure, even if in those patients, ADH being on and retaining free water is bad for the patient. Okay, okay, I got it. So just because ADH secretion is not desired in third spacing diseases doesn't mean that it's inappropriate. Sort of like that weird uncle that we never really wanted to show up for our wedding. He was still on the guest list, though, so technically it was appropriate for him to be there. We just weren't really thrilled about it. Yeah, just keep your eye on that envelope, Tim. <laughs> okay. So true. All right, let's keep our eye on the main question then. <laughs> How are we going to figure out if that ADH signal that we're detecting from that high urine osm is appropriate or inappropriate? Which one of our hyponatremia lab friends is going to help us out here? The main purpose of urine sodium is to help answer the question, is the ADH that's being released appropriate or inappropriate? In other words, is it being released by your body in an attempt to maintain intravascular filling or not? Okay, wait a minute here. I always thought that urine sodium just tells us if RAS or that renin angiotensin aldosterone system is on or not. I never thought that urine sodium is going to help us distinguish between appropriate or inappropriate ADH secretion. I didn't either. And we're going to put it all together with a couple of cases in a minute. But the pathophys teaching point is that 
if ADH is appropriately on because of some low sensed blood volume state, you can bet RAS will be on too. The idea is the RAS system is our body's first line defense to hypovolemia, and then it activates ADH. Because when you're intravascularly depleted, whether for real or in a perceived way, the first thing your body does is it doesn't increase ADH, it, it, it activates the renin-angiotensin system and causes you to retain sodium. Only when that isn't enough does it then go on to upregulate ADH and hold on to water, right? Very interesting. Okay, so first RAS and then ADH. But how much volume loss does it take for ADH to get going? And we're not talking like a little bit of hypovolemia, like they're a little dry. Like it's got to be pretty severe hypovolemia, right? If you remember these curves you saw in medical school, like the ADH response doesn't really even kick in to like 10 to 15% blood volume loss. So we're not talking like a little bit of volume loss. We're talking like a lot. It should be pretty obvious. Whoa, 10 to 15% volume loss for ADH release? We're going to link a nice graph in the show notes that beautifully illustrates this. Think about all the patients you see that don't get hyponatremic, who are volume depleted. There are a lot of them, right? Probably most of them, in fact that have like a UTI or whatever, and they're hypovolemic and they're hypotensive, but their sodium is fine, right? It hasn't been enough for them to get ADH release and as a result, hyponatremic. So that really hammers home the point that if sense volume is low enough for ADH to be on, you can bet that RAS will be on as well. And that's where urine sodium can really help us. Okay, so real quick urine sodium basics here. The slam dunk thresholds here are a urine sodium of less than 20 and greater than 30, with a frustratingly common middle territory that we're going to get to in just a minute. If the urine sodium is below 20, we are fairly confident that those beans are sensing a low effect of blood volume. If the urine sodium is low, then you can say with some certainty that they're sodium avid, and that means that the body wants to hold on to more sodium. And the reason they're sodium avid is because angiotensin 2 is resulting in more proximal tubular reabsorption, and aldosterone is resulting in more distal tubular reabsorption of sodium. And of course, water follows the sodium and you become more volume replete. And on the flip side, if urine sodium is greater than 30, assuming that the patient hasn't been on diuretics and you can measure the urine sodium appropriately, then if it's not low, then RAS is probably not on. And keep in mind, we need to interpret the urine sodium with caution if that urine's abhorrent. And this is also on the assumption that they're making, you know, that they're not making a ton of urine. If they were making a lot of dilute urine, then the urine sodium's not helpful. It's just diluted. Okay, so to put this together with two scenarios, let's say you get back labs and your patient has a high urinosum, but a low urine sodium, like less than 20. Okay, I got this. High urinosum low urine sodium. They line up well to tell me that the body is sensing low effective blood volume. A low urine sodium means RAS is on, and the high urine osms tells me that there's quite a bit of true or sensed hypovolemia so that ADH is also on. Okay, and a second scenario. What if your labs come back and the patient has a high urine osms and a high urine sodium? What does that mean? Whoa, 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 whoa. High urine osm and high urine sodium? No, no, that just feels wrong to me. Like a peanut butter and mayonnaise sandwich. So if you send the urine sodium and it's high, and that suggests that your kidneys have no interest in holding onto sodium, that should make you stop and say for a moment, the scenario no longer makes sense. I'm saying that the person is releasing ADH to try to defend intravascular volume, but they're not holding onto sodium. That's not an internally consistent. So either I have to come up with another reason for why the urine sodium is high, Like, for example, they're on diuretics, so they're wasting sodium. Or my theory has to be revised. Yeah, our theory likely should be revised because the high urine osms are telling us that ADH is on, but the high urine sodium is telling us that RAS is off, which means sense blood volume is just fine. So what the heck is all that ADH around for? This, ladies and gentlemen, is the definition of inappropriate ADH secretion. Oh, man. Y'all can't see me, but I am standing and slow clapping. In these cases, we love it when the urine sodium is greater than 30. Remember, without diuretics on board, because you can clearly pin it on inappropriate ADH. And on the flip side, it's also nice when urine sodium is undetectable. But what do we do in those situations when it's in the 20s or 30s? Because 
let's be honest, urine sodium is always in the 20s or the 30s. The FINA, the fractional excretion of sodium, is a more sensitive measure of um, sodium reabsorption or sodium avidity than the urine sodium alone. And if you find that a urine sodium is not as low as you would expect it to be, it's maybe 20 or 30, and you calculate a FINA, you should trust the FINA because that is a more sensitive measure. The FINA? Of all the dramatics? <laughs> the FINA? This, this is an AKI guy, right? Am I wrong? What is happening here? I know, right? But remember, Marty, what FINA really is. It's just a fancy equation that adjusts the urine sodium to the other solutes in the urine and the blood. We're all familiar with a FINA of less than one suggesting that a patient's pre-renal, right? So yeah, we're all familiar with the use of FINA in the context of acute kidney injury, right? Less than one suggests the patient's pre-renal, their kidneys are sodium avid. But there's no reason you can't use FINA in the workup of hyponatremia. It's just that you can't use the same 1% cutoff as you would with AKI. And that's because, you have to remember, people with normal GFRs will have FINAs of one or even less. And that's because the total amount of sodium that a healthy person filters is so high. So when you have a hyponatremic patient with normal kidney function, their FINA will have to be much, much lower than one to convince you that they are sodium avid. How low? That's a subject of some debate, but it's probably somewhere between 0.5% and 0.15%. Okay, so what this boils down to is when your urine sodium is sort of indeterminate, check a FINA. And if you get a value less than 0.5%, or if you really want to be on the safe side, 0.15%, you're done. RAS is on. And we also know that urine sodium interpretation isn't really valid in patients on diuretic therapy, since these drugs work by blocking the kidney's ability to reabsorb sodium. And just like when we get in a jam with patients with AKI, here comes Efeuria to the rescue. We can use it with some degree of, of diagnostic accuracy of assessing the renin angiotensin aldosterone system in an indirect way. We want to do it through sodium, but we can't. So we use kind of a, a sort of real, a second cousin of sodium because it sort of follows sodium in a lot of ways in the nephron. So we use efeuria because urea is not directly affected by diuretic use. So here, efeuria less than 55% is like a urine sodium less than 20 or a fena less than 0.5%. It points to RAS activation, sends hypovolemia. And when it comes to supporting information for RAS activation, more is, well, more. You know, in the early studies where these cutoffs were established, the combination of efeuria less than 55% and FENA less than 0.5% was better at predicting fluid responsiveness than either of those parameters alone. Ah, love me multiple data points to go by. But in addition to patients that are on diuretics and that messing up the urine sodium picture, there are other times where your patient might have a low effective blood volume and a high urine sodium. Remember, that just shouldn't go together. And it's going to be in rare scenarios like primary adrenal insufficiency, where both cortisol and aldosterone are deficient and all that sodium is being peed out into the urine. Bringing back adrenal insufficiency. Love it, Trey. Okay, I think we're ready to summarize Pearl 4 on urine sodium. Yes. So, okay, what I'm taking away is that in patients with hypotonic hyponatremia, where there's a high urine osm and we know ADH is around reabsorbing free water, it's going to be the urine sodium that's going to help us answer two questions. One, is that ADH appropriately on or inappropriate? And is that RAS system active or not? Right. And if the RAS is not active, but you're seeing ADH being secreted, so think cases where urine sodium is greater than 40 and urine osm is greater than 200, this is the definition of inappropriate ADH secretion. And I'm still slow clapping. The other mind blower of this pearl was the re-emergence of FENA, but in hyponatremia. In this setting, we're using it in that all too common indeterminate urine sodium between 20 and 30. And here, we're using a lower cutoff, 0.5%, meaning that below that, we're in the low effective blood volume world. And we're going to finish this pearl by letting John summarize his rule of thumb on fractional excretions and hyponatremia. We can use the fractional excretion of sodium, of urea, of uric acid. We can use any of these things in anybody. Um, it's just a question of the threshold that we adopt. 
basically. So I think the one sentence that is always true is the lower the fractional excretion of blank, you know, be it urea or sodium or uric acid, the more likely it is uh, that that patient is in fact hypovolemic or is in fact sodium avid. But once you try to pin yourself to a threshold, you know, below which everybody is, you know, sodium avid and above which everyone is not, that's when you run into trouble. That, that's the problem. Let's pop back to our patient in the emergency department one more time. Remember guys, we already found out she had a low serum osmolality and an elevated urine osmolality. And so we add on a urine sodium just to check if RAS is active. And wouldn't you know it, it comes back right in that indeterminate range at 26. And this is especially unhelpful because she says she might be on a thiazide, but she's not sure when she took her last dose. So now what do we do? Yes, of course it's 26, Tim, because it's always in the 20s. Here, we're going to reach for our last friend, which is serum uric acid. I like to think of this as your Yoshi of the N64 Mario Kart game. Hear me out here. It's probably not your first choice, right? So that's clearly Toad or Princess Peach if you're racing, and obviously Donkey Kong or Bowser if you're battling. Yoshi, like serum uric acid, if you're in a situation where you have to use it, you're not completely upset. Uh, like a fourth line test kind of thing. You're, you're totally in the dark and you're like, I wish I had some other tests. It turns out that the serum uric acid can actually give us something to break the tie between SIADH and something else. I have consistently found a serum uric acid level to be a valuable thing to send when I am working someone up for hyponatremia. Okay, so this is definitely a learning point for me. What's the mechanism here? Theoretically, you know, SIADH is sort of a volume expanded state, although it doesn't have to be, right? You could be euvolemic and have SIADH, but the physiology seems to be predicated on the fact that the relative increase of volume in the, in the plasma results in some dilution of the uric acid. Um, so they tend to be hypouricemic and hyperurocosuric. So to translate that from nephrology speak to English, in SIADH, you'll tend to have low serum uric acid and high urine uric acid. I, I think I got that. Then the converse is true in um, volume depletion where you are you know, reabsorbing a lot of it. Yeah, and the way I make it stick for myself because urine acid handling can get quite complicated is a watered down version thinking about how CBCs get concentrated when there's low effective blood volume states. So similarly, if somebody's volume down, I like to think that the serum uric acid gets concentrated and that serum uric acid level is going to be high. I understand why you wouldn't want to send a serum uric acid level on someone with CKD, right? Those people are going to have baseline elevations in uric acid level. And the trouble doesn't stop with CKD either. An elevated serum uric acid can be high in a lot of things like gout, kidney stones, hypertension. Heck, it can even be higher in men than premenopausal women. But it's going to be the low serum uric acid that can be helpful in SIADH. Usually, it's going to be a serum uric acid level less than 4. And John has a very practical reason why serum uric acid is his favorite test. You know, a lot of times people come in with hyponatremia and they've already gotten fluid and you got the urine studies and you're like, what am I going to do? I don't know how to interpret this. Well, guess what? At our hospital, the lab holds on to the blood for seven days. So if I wanted to, I could add on a uric acid level to the very first basic metabolic panel they had before there was any confounding effect of treatment or time whatsoever. Whoa, that is actually brilliant. So before you guys go flooding your lab with requests for seven-day-old uric acid levels, be aware that there are a couple states to be mindful of when using uric acid this way. Right, so there are a few cases where we see serum uric acid being low, and it's going to be conditions like cirrhosis, right, where there might be reduced hepatic synthesis of it. And naturally, endocrinopathies are going to muck things up. So thyroid or adrenal disorders uh, can also have a low uric acid. And then like random situations like renal salt wasting or cerebral salt wasting can also get a low serum uric acid. But for the most part, low uric acid level can be helpful in pointing toward SIDH and away from low effective blood volume states. And if you want a quick story to drive home how this test might be useful, let's hear from John again. It's very hard to argue with a low uric acid level. Like that is incompatible with hypovolemic hyponatremia. 
it's like flat neck veins and trying to tell me that the person has CHF. It does not make sense, you know? The the patient that I told you about, the one who went to the ICU, I added on the serum uric acid level. It was 2.2. Had we added on the uric acid level, that would have been enough to be like, it does not make sense to say that this is all hypovolemia. That could have averted this. Oof, that is some hard-hitting stuff there. Yeah, agreed. And since we want to keep in mind those other conditions that can alter serum uric acid levels, one way that we can improve that diagnostic yield is just to calculate an FE uric acid. Wait a minute, an FE who? <laughs> an FE uric acid? <laughs> Calm down, Marty, it's okay. Listen, like any other fractional excretion, we're just adjusting the plasma level to try and figure out what that kidney is doing with the uric acid it sees. And again, this kind of gets hairy, but generally speaking, we expect FE uric acid to be higher, like greater than 11% in cases like SIADH. And on the other side of the coin, a lower FE uric acid, like less than 11%, is going to be more consistent with lower effective blood volume states. All right, great. Shrey, I think we're ready to summarize Pearl 5 here. Yeah. So what I've learned is not to give too much mind when I get back a high serum uric acid level, since so many things can cloud that picture. But it's going to be a low serum uric acid level, generally less than 4, that can be helpful in terms of pointing towards SIADH, with the caveat that we can also see a low serum uric acid level in cirrhosis or some endocrinopathies. And if you want more data points for SIADH, in addition to a serum uric acid being low, a high FE uric acid greater than 11% or so can help you feel more confident about SIADH. And that's a wrap for today's episode. If you want to learn even more about hyponatremia, don't forget to check out the corresponding article at AMBOSS linked in our show notes. If you found this episode helpful, please share with your team and your colleagues and give it a rating on Apple Podcasts or whatever podcast app you use. It really does help people find us. And if you want to add your own tips, please share them with us, tweet us, or leave us a comment on our website or Instagram or Facebook page. A very big thank you to our peer reviewers, Dr. Helbert Rondon and Dr. Larissa Kruger Gomes. Also, a huge shout out to Shi Yu Yang for her first time audio editing on A Five Pearls. And of course, our ever trusted Solon Kelleher for the audio editing. Also, big thank you to Dr. Raul Mayeshwari and Priyo Patel for the accompanying graphics. And thank you to Dr. Sean Burke and Dr. Clem Lee for off air producing this episode as well. Stay tuned for the next hyponatremia episode on management. As always, we love hearing feedback. Email us at hello at coreimpodcast.com. Opinions expressed are our own and do not represent the opinions of any of our affiliated institutions. All right. See you later. Yep. Guilty. I have definitely been one of those teams that checked serum osmolality, Q6, Q8 hours with all the other hyponatremia labs. What did I say? You you stumbled over osmolality. Oh, what did I say? Osmolality or (laughs) osmolality. I don't know. You left it. I thought say it in Boston. Osmolality. (laughs) (laughs) I'm sorry. Going down the street, went to Dunkin' Donuts, checked my osmolality. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, okay. Uh, that's all in. America, we are endowed by our creator with certain unalienable rights, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. At Grand Canyon University, we believe in equal opportunity, and the American dream starts with purpose. By honoring your career calling, you impact your family, your friends, and your community. The pursuit to serve others is yours. Find your purpose at Grand Canyon University. Private, Christian, affordable. Visit gcu.edu.